This is SPTV. Welcome back, everyone, for round two with Mitch Brisker, Scientology's oh. film director. Um, we are going to do a, a, a live Q&A this evening. Um, and it's funny, Mitch, I put up a post in my community tab on, on YouTube saying, hey, we're going to do another chat. Any right. questions you guys would like us to discuss? The most popular comment in response to that was about what a dick I was to you in our <laughs> last interview. <laughs> And how I need to be more sympathetic to you and appreciate different perspectives and all this kind of stuff. So, Mitch, I apologize for being yeah, a flaming dick so, to you. Aaron, should we just tell them we were role playing? <laughs> <laughs> we were staging some YouTube beef to uh, yeah. gin up interest in Mitch's new YouTube channel. Um, yeah, I, I think we were both having a bad day, but I, I didn't get <laughs> I didn't get that. You know, I think some of your audience just a few of them might be just a little bloodthirsty and they really <laughs> wanted to take you to they wanted to take you to town on that but we're, we're good you guys should know we're good man we're like bros so this, and and no by the way mitch does actually have um a youtube channel now and i'm gonna with ask one you, 15 second video <laughs> <laughs> okay so let's see um i should i guess i'm on the wrong page let me back up i'll show everyone the actual channel itself Look at me. I got yeah, my... I'll announce the book on there and then I'll start putting up content. Okay, good. So if you search Mitch Brisker, I'm not sure, you know, it's like Serge, uh, you know, um, I just did a, a live chat with Serge when he created his channel. There was something about his name or those words that were so common that even if you searched the exact name of the channel, it was hard to find on YouTube. It, it, you can find it now, but in the beginning it was. So I don't know if Mitch Brisker. I don't know if like you're the top result for Mitch Brisker, but in case you're not, I, I think so. It's pretty unique. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, I, mean, the, I mean, Mitch, but, what is that? It rhymes with, you know what? So it's, other than that, it's, <laughs> it's pretty common. Yeah. I, for whatever reason, you can't find it under Mitch Brisker. You can certainly find it under at Scientology dash the dash big dash lie 57 subs. Let's see if we can, uh, <laughs> sprinkle some of that SPTV magic on you this evening. And why don't we just show everybody um, the video that you've put up, which is sort of a trailer, a preview video for your book. So let's watch this real quick. Okay, now let's do it with like the actual screen centered appropriately. I realize I'm zoomed in on this. <laughs> What am I doing wrong here, you guys? All right, let's. I mean, you've been you've been at this like ten hours a day, so I'm. I'm I know. I'm not, I'm not surprised. Let's do it again, folks. Okay. All right, bada bing. Uh, and if that sounded a little bit like the old. Dianetics infomercial music. Um, the similarity questions out, but what's that? Yeah, it was inspired. That whole thing was inspired a, a bit by the Dianetics campaign. Are we good? Yeah, we're I haven't good. seen that face in a while, Aaron. What, oh, what was the, that? The next video started to autoplay and it was playing oh. in my in my ear. <laughs> That's no good. Well, let's um, do some questions. I'm dying to do it. Yeah, guys. Um, we do have um a, a lot of questions already uh proposed in the in the um you know, the post that I put up in the community tab, and we're going to go through some of those, but in the live chat here, uh, put questions, put all caps question colon or semicolon, and then put your question and uh, make it easier for me to see. And then I'll put those questions in the queue. In the meantime, let's start with some of the preloaded stuff here. Um, so, okay, let's start with an easy one, an easy one, a relatively short one here. What difference did you notice in how David Mis what did what difference did you notice in David Miscavige in how he spoke to or treated the civilian actors who were hired by Scientology uh, and how he treated the production team versus how he treated the Sea Org members who worked on the base? Well, I mean, I'll tell you, he didn't interact much like he rarely ever came to the set which is where most of that kind of interaction would be. But I mean, I can tell you, David Miscavige is like He's a narcissist, like he's like a sociopath. And so he's capable 
of what they call cognitive empathy, which means he can calculate in a situation whatever the emo appropriate emotion is. Like he's at a funeral, people are sad. He can calculate, oh, I need to be sad. So he's at a, a you know, a, a, an opening event like for a ideal org or he may be the few times he visited on the set because maybe there is a well-known Scientologist that he wanted to say hello to. He knows he can calculate whatever the appropriate, uh, you know, presence that he needs to have. And it can be very charming. So uh, where where he, it was quite different with the with the, the, the sewer guys. I mean, I was mostly shielded from that, except, you know, I, I think I told you the story, Aaron, of the three executives that I saw him uh, physically and emotionally, uh, verbally abusing, and which is one of the things that completely turned me around in terms of wanting to work for the church and be a Scientologist. But it it's a huge difference. I mean, if you've known somebody that can be really terrifying and also really charming, I mean, he's just th that person. Like, like you, you know, you've seen him at the videos at Ideal Org openings and, and when yeah. he's interacting, yeah, when he's interacting with, you know, the dignitaries, well, they, you, that they can get, I mean, they, you know, after the Ellie Morale race, that's going to be kind of difficult, I think, for them to pull it. But he could be very charming with those people. It's like, it's amazing. So, was your it's, general experience with Miscavige such that when you, when you did see those three executives being treated the way that they were in the incident that you're referring to, was that a shock to you? Or was there something about your prior experience with him that was like, I kind of expected something like this was happening. Uh, it was 100% a shock, and it was not, okay, it wasn't shocking, but it was a shock. And I know that sounds weird. I wasn't shocked that he did it, because I always sort of suspected that he had this, this really, this strain of, of, of able to do that. What was shocking is that he did it in front of me, that he, because mm. that had never happened before. I mean, he chose to stage this little massacre of these three people on the hot sidewalk. I mean, it was July, it was 110 degrees. The sidewalk must have been 120. And these guys, you know, two men and a woman, and they're sitting, they're all executives, and I know them, and I've worked with them, and they're sitting on their butts, you know, on the, uh, you know, and they're just, their face is wet with tears and sweat. And it's just a horrific scene. I hear him, and I turn the corner, and it's too late for me to like avoid it. And he just turns to me pointing at them and he's screaming that's why you don't have a Dianetics campaign so he like drew me into it so you hear this term you know there's so much of psychology that's kind of gotten into you know the the internet world like you have the pop psychology and people like to talk about you know their narcissistic exes and all this kind of stuff but it's a very real concept that a person who's sociopathic like that at some point their mask will just drop and when you see them without the mask, it's like a horror film where the whole time, you know, it's like Phantom of the Opera, right? The guy takes a mask off and you're like, whoa, it was so it was shocking that he did it in front of me because I was always like so protected. And then, you know, the a problem is you let's say you go in session, you're going to get some kind of auditing. Maybe it's a sex check. Maybe it's just auditing in general. And you know, you start talking about that, like, you know, do you have a quote unquote an ARC break or whatever? And they're like, yeah, like I saw David Miscavige, like brutalizing these three people that I really care about. That I, I one of them in particular, the woman I really uh, thought she was really a, sincerely an idealist in terms of wanting to make a better world. But that's just like, you know, that's where they have the truth rundown. Have you spoken about that on your channel the, at all? The uh, Do you mean the auditing action? Yeah, no, I don't mean the article. I mean, that's why they called the article the truth. But the auditing action, the truth rundown. You end up uh, you know, getting a truth rundown, which. I've um, I've mentioned it in videos here. and Yeah, there. It's, it's just it. If the North Koreans had that kind of technology, they wouldn't have had to torture those servicemen. Did they, you get the truth it, rundown? Yeah, I did. I'm probably one of the few people outside the Sea Org that got it. Wow. I got it uh, supervised by my dear friend, Marty Rathbun. What did you What did you do that prompted them to? Yeah, see I don't even that. remember. I don't even remember. Marty, he's an emotional vampire, and he, instead of blood, he feasts on fear of people. Like that's his thing, right? Huh. 
Huh. So, you know, somehow I ended up on the menu. Wow. And, um, I don't remember. It, you know, it's, it could have been any number of things, but it's pretty amazing, especially, I mean, I survived it just fine. I'm pretty resilient, but I really, I did fall prey to it. Like the thing is, it's this devious way of getting you, it's weaponized gaslighting. You know about it, right? You want to know it's, something crazy? Sure. I did not know until after I left Scientology, A, what the truth rundown actually was, and B, uh -huh. that it was the mandatory final step or one of the mandatory final steps on the RPF. I had no oh idea. Oh, my God. I yeah, had no idea until Leah Remini described what she went through getting the truth rundown, oh, what the it. truth That's rundown right. actually yeah. was. Yeah. That's wild. Did you, you did hey, not, were you yeah were you, were you under the impression um that Miscavige staged that little scenario for your benefit? No, absolutely not. He had no way of knowing that I was going to be coming by. Okay. No, the, he just didn't know. It was entirely random. The my it was yeah. He he would no, not know what direction I was coming from or I think he just completely lost it. Hmm. Uh, he 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 was staging that in front of uh, everybody at Gold who was going to dinner, you know. Most of the people, you know, you either you either go to the dining room from across the street, you come down in that direction, or you come from the direction I was coming from. So, and it's about a 50-50 deal. So he was staging it. Actually, even the people coming the other way, they would have seen it as they turned the corner. And I'm sure he purposely did it there because why not? I mean, it's like everybody's walking to dinner. Uh, he's doing it in front of a crowd of people. It's just like, yeah, it was completely nuts. So. Wow. Yeah, I'm I'm sure he'll regret it. I mean, I, I think I said this the other day. I was talking about this, that I'm certain that he is full of just tremendous shame for all these horrible things he's done. But he's so narcissistic that he deflects that shame onto other people. He thinks it comes from other people. Like mm -hmm. if he saw Mike Rinder, he, he would feel horrible. But he'd think it was Mike that was making him feel horrible. Do you get what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. he's like that mentally ill. So... It's Incredible. the reason why he left the base and whenever it was 2013, 2014 and told me personally, like just one on one, he said, I'm never coming back here. There's too many people who fucked me over. Incredible. And, you know, yeah, it's like amazing. And that means, no, there's too many people here. I feel so much shame confronting these people that I can't handle it. And so therefore, the only way because I can't process the shame, uh, it's because they fucked me over. So that's yeah. nuts. I mean, that's just like. So, I mean, to, what a Scientologist should realize is that David Miscavige blew the int base. I mean, that's what happened. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he's yeah, he's just kind of slowly sinking more and more into that delusional delusional thing, and he's bringing some people down with him. I mean, you asked yeah. me the, the other day, I really biffed the question, but you asked me what my goal was, and I didn't understand it because I've been focused on bigger goals, not what I'm trying to do with this, right? But remember you asked me that, and I was kind of... Uh, 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 Oh, when um, I asked you, um, what was your, uh, what drove you to write the book? What were you looking to accomplish by writing yeah, the yeah, book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but initially, you said, so what's your goal here? And you know, I, I was so off my game. I should have realized I'm talking to you, so you're not asking me about career goals. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? I mean, I should have just known that. But um, so yeah, my goal is to clear the planet of Scientology. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. That's more of an objective. But no, my point is, is I really want, there's people that need to be held accountable for all this stuff. And there's uh, an aging group of Sea Org members that are looking at uh, a really bad outcome. And I think, you know, the church should be, be held responsible for their genuine care. Like not just the, you know what I'm saying? Not just like throwing Heber in a nursing home like they've done. So yeah. anyway, that's my it's an objective. It's more of an objective than a goal. I know that's a strange differentiation, but yeah, I get it. Uh, Denver Stevo says, hi, Mitch. Hey, Denver Stevo. How involved were you in David Miscavige's phenomenal nightline interview and the Scientology B roll? Still a huge fan of your fresh insights and Osa still smells like poo. Aaron, I'm eating at <laughs> Colorado's best French dip tonight. Oh, I'm getting jealous. Oh, um, Boy, did you have any involvement French. in the nightline? Uh, no, debacle? none. I mean, I was I was uh, first and foremost a filmmaker working on the tech films, and that was in the early 90s. I think that was like in 90, wasn't it? Didn't that happen in 1990? Maybe 92. Okay, but so I was like, I was hands off. I was like 
that was during the time when Miss Gavage, he he didn't want the stink of all of that to land on me. You know what I'm saying? I was like, uh, uh, you know, it was like I, I, I was working on L. Ron Hubbard's technical training films. So you don't want to kind of let those things, uh, you don't want the mission to creep into that. As time went by, especially by the time, by 2008 when Anonymous happened, I mean, I was, I was called upon often to do PR positive stuff. I was never a dirty tricks person. You know, I kept maybe some videos on some of the anonymous guys that were kind of nasty, but uh, I mean, the videos are nasty, not them. But no, I had nothing to do with that. I witnessed the whole thing happening. And um, meaning you were there or what? Well, no, I, I was there when he was like drilling it and he and Mike were working on it because I knew I knew Mike really well. So I knew that it was going to happen. I mean, Mike was the first executive at Gold that I worked with directly on anything because I worked with him on the Elridge Life Exhibition because that was his project. Because, you know, before he worked at OSA, he was an Elridge personal PR, public relations officer international, or in the acronym Obsessed Sea Org, Elridge Paper Row Int. Uh, anyway. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, I'm I curious, though, what, did you hear any of the chatter after the fact of whether they thought he had knocked it out of the park or anything like that? Absolutely. He did. He thought kidding? it was incredible, right? He oh, it was great. my God. He, he owned Ted Koppel. <laughs> he pawned him. I mean, yeah, I mean, when I started research, because I did the, the this, is, this is kind of tangential, forgive me, but when I did the LRH Life Exhibition, <clears throat> um, there's this story about, we're, we won't go into it in detail, sometime we can, the uh, Alaska Mental Health Enabling Bill, this, which was known as Siberia USA. You probably heard about this thing. Yeah, I never knew it? if yeah. it was real or not. I never, I never knew if it was propaganda or not. Uh, it's both propaganda and real. It okay. was a real thing that was intended to help the native Alaskans who were being arrested for being mentally ill because they didn't speak English and they were being railroaded to a private hospital in Oregon owned by a businessman who was a friend of Teddy Roosevelt's and the government was paying him tons of money to house these people, and it was completely corrupt. So the U.S. Congress, you know, Alaska was a territory, and we're responsible for it. And the U.S. Congress basically said, no, put an end to this corruption. We're going to actually set aside a million acres of Alaskan land, and the money that comes from maintaining it, we're going to take care of the health care and mental illness problems of Native Alaskans. Some whack job, right-wing, anti-commie, Remember, this, it's 1955, 56. This is in the days when, you know, you had the John Birch Society and you had people who thought that fluoride in our water was a communist plot. You had all this stuff. So these kind of whack jobs, they said, those million acres, they're going to build a Siberia in Alaska. And they're going to they're going to lessen the, the the rules for which you could grab people and, and, and throw them, you know, in what do you call that? But committing. So then. A commitment laws, so you, they're going to lessen the commitment laws, and and then L. Ron Herbert got on the bandwagon with this, and made it part of his anti psychiatry thing. So they were trying to maintain this corrupt system because special interests wanted the million acres of land. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? They defeated the trust that was set up, and L. Ron Hubbard took credit for saving America from being taken over by a communist plot. Oh my God. Okay, in the early 80s, th that was thrown out uh, and the trust was reinstated and, you know, Alaska became a state. But the, they, the whole thing eventually went through. But still to this day, Scientology, and I helped them do it, they claim that they defeated this Siberia USA bill, which it never was. It was a bill to exploit Native Alaskans. Uh, with fake mental health incarcerations and then be paid by the government for housing them in hospitals. And David Miscavige went on Ted Koppel. Uh, this comes back to Ted Koppel. To, you asked me about the interview. It comes back to that. And he went on there and he said, now, you know, Ted, because that's that's uh, like a, a tactic he does. Ted, you know, uses your first name a lot. Like when Tom went on, uh, what's his name? And it was like, now, Matt, 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 Matt Lowry. It's like, Matt, memories and Matt. Now, Matt, 
Uh, that's like a tactic to intimidate somebody. So when he was on with Ted Couple, he said, now, Ted, you have to realize you don't know about this. You never heard this. But in 1956, there was a Siberia USA bill. And he just went through the whole thing. I mean, the entire thing is a lie. Hmm. And, it, and I don't even think he knows it. I think he's read the Hubbard accounting of it and just bought it. But it, it's, you can, it's not that difficult to research. But And I did a documentary uh, in, in the museum that that extols the virtues of CCHR and it and the Alaska bill is that Siberia USA is one of the tent poles that CCHR uses to prop up its its reputation and Absolutely. I was shamed I mean I looked at this and I went oh my god I because I just bought it and then just put it in a documentary wow because it sounds so plausible anyway so, sorry for taking all that time but no that's all right you know there's there, there's a big chunk of that of, of that Ted couple thing. I mean, he went on for about three minutes and you know, his, his nose, like if, if he would have been Pinocchio, his nose would have been like three feet long by the time that, that piece of it was done. Amazing. And, you know, the, of course the Ted couple people, they, they didn't check it out. You know, that they, they didn't yeah. know he was going to say it. Exactly. Um, anyway. Okay. Lewis, um, uh, Lou Ray, St. Louis. Uh, did you know Bonnie Mason at gold? Who Bonnie, Bonnie Mason. What's her last name? Say it a little louder. Mason. Bonnie Mason. I knew a Bonnie. Was she in services? Oh, I don't know. I don't I'm know. I'm asking. Bonnie Mason the, is. I, yeah, whatever. It, it, <laughs> I did. I knew a Bonnie. Is that person there? Are they listening? I um, knew a Bonnie that was in services, but I don't. Lou Ray, uh, give us a little more information about Bonnie Mason in the chat, and we will uh, come back and revisit this one. Yeah. Plus, you know, so many people up there had. Uh, women had just multiple names. You know that. It's like a C work thing. Because they get married they, so many times. Yeah, they get married so often. It's like, well, I didn't know her as Monty Mason, but I knew her as, you know. Yeah. Okay, Free Zenu Project wants to know, Mitch, do you think David Miscavige has lost it so completely that he's become out of touch with reality, actually believing his own BS, even when he makes it up? What are your thoughts here? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's, I think, that part of convincing other people, part of being really convincing is to convince yourself. I think the, the most, like uh, Steve Jobs is famously known as a person that can convince himself and others of un just unbelievable things. And of course he did something great. He was trying to change the world in one way. And, and David Miscavige was trying to change the other. But I, I think that being able to convince yourself of, of something is key to being able to convince others. I think if you're like crossing your fingers behind your back, while you're convincing people, I think people pick up on it. So I, I think there's a kind of a transition, transformation that people go through when they when they want to put forth this whatever it is, and they convince themselves of it, and it makes them a lot more believable. There's a story, and it's like method acting. <laughs> no, sorry, but I can't remember whether this story, whether the first hand person who was involved in it was either Claire Headley or Tom DeVocht or Mike Rinder, but it was something about Shelly saying something offhand to one of them that she was really starting to worry about whether um, Miscavige was losing it. And, uh, it's Mike Rinder who I remember specifically told a story of Dave walking out of building 50 or whatever building is the RTC headquarters there and going like, oh, where did I, where did I put the gold? Like, where did I put the gold? <laughs> and Mike tells a story and he's like, he was like nobody knew what the hell he was talking about. Now yeah, there's a chance so, there's a chance that only Miscavige knew what he was talking about, but it seemed to everybody yeah. that he was coming unhinged. And I think that's where a question like this kind of comes from. Did did you ever get any of that like what the hell no, kind of No, if you gave me any kind of solid evidence that he was delusional, it, I, it would be very easy to believe it, but actually no because um like I said, because he's capable of cognitive empathy. And I think you lose that when you become delusional. You can no longer even recognize the the sing, the singles signals in the environment that would tell you how to act a certain way. Like you wouldn't even know if you were at a funeral and you saw people that were sad. You wouldn't know that you were supposed to be sad. So I don't I don't think of him as delusional. I think of him as uh, deluded, but not delusional. Here's yep. something that comes to mind. Yeah. And again, at a distance, you never know if you're getting the right information or perceiving things correctly sure. sometimes when you're not there. But 
when I read what Miscavige said at one of the events post lockdowns that, and I could be slightly misstating this, but it was something that Scientology's stats went up like 62 X. Yeah. Uh, oh, that was probably after the golden age of tech two. And then more people crossed the thresholds of Scientology organizations during the lockdowns than ever before in Scientology's history. There is a part of me that goes, you have to be delusional to think that the people at this event are going to believe that. <laughs> um, he, I, I mean, he likes a good story. That's a good story. So. It's, a, it's a good story. <laughs> yeah, it's a um, good story. It's like uh, Keith Richards snorting his grandfather's ashes. You know, <laughs> like, did he really do that? Or is it a good story? I don't know. Um, yeah, I can tell you something. I can tell you something. I mean... I could have been so deeply into all of this that I just have missed a lot. Uh, like my perception could be kind of uh, filtered, uh, distorted. But I, he seemed to me that if he was going to spin a tale, I'm, I'm specifically referring to exaggerating statistics, like for these rolling thunder event openings, right? Mm -hmm. Or this kind of statistic that you're talking about. He'd always want to start with some kernel of truth and build on it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I remember, because uh, he'd always question people's statistics. He wouldn't just say, oh, that sounds like a good number. He'd say, well, where's that from? Or where did you get that from? And then he'd kind of calculate a way to justify it if there was something there or, or torque it or reject it. Like an example is back when they were, we were very active uh, with the Youth for Human Rights campaign, the PSAs, remember those? Mm -hmm. And they were running that campaign in different countries. I think it was a, maybe South America, maybe it was Argentina. They bought a bunch of airtime on a cable station. So like, let's say that that cable station had 5 million subscribers and they'd run an ad on that cable station. So the statistic would be that the, the message of Youth for Human Rights was delivered to 5 million households. But you don't even know if 10 people saw it. Right, because there's a whole different thing, right? Yeah, and nobody, yeah. nobody else in the world would use a statistic like that. But it, he was satisfied with that because it's like, oh, it's based on something. So I'm curious when he said that, like, if there was something it was based on, like, like I don't know, something completely that had nothing to do with anything, something as as weird as well, you know, we there, you know, it showed up on uh, in. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. Like five million subscribers had an opportunity to see it. Nobody knows how many did. So sure. Well, like they were printing up all those booklets on like how to clean your hands during the that could have been it. They could have been like number of booklets distributed to businesses. Yeah, well, then know. became people who crossed the threshold. If it could have been, yeah, we distributed right. like seven times more of those booklets than any other particle in Scientology. And that could easily be, be translated into what well, we brought them into our sphere. So yeah, the, you get what I mean? There's always a, there has to be a, a sort of a starting off point. Totally. It's just not pulled out of thin air. Totally. Uh, Joni Cummings says, I've seen parts of David Miscavige's of David Miscavige's interview and thought I was watching a troll. Aaron and Mitch, thank you for the live. Love learning more about David Miscavige and Scientology. I want to thank both of you for keeping me away from Scientology. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. That's our pleasure. Is that related to any Cummings that we know? I doubt it. Um, oh, okay, good. That's Tom, a common name. Tom Cummins. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom Cummins, I think, doesn't have a G at the end. It's Cummins, I believe. Oh, yeah. It's Cum yeah, I think you're right. Uh, the, uh, is she referring to the Ted Koppel interview? I think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't think she, I think, but she probably means like a little bridge troll. I don't think she yeah, means no, an I internet troll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. By the way, I haven't noticed whether Lewis jumped in with any more information about Bonnie Mason. I'm looking for it real quick. Um, oh, 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 oh. Here it is. Um, Bonnie Gold, working in 1986. Bonnie Willett was her maiden name. Her brother and mother are still at Gold. She left Gold in 2006. She was married to Aaron Mason at Gold, who was one of COB's writers. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I knew Aaron. Uh, you knew I, Aaron I, Mason? I did, yeah, I did. I knew him pretty well. Uh, okay. But not tried, his wife, no, I didn't, Bonnie. No, 
I, I don't remember his wife. Okay. He had been an editor at, for Freedom Magazine at OSA. Mm. And then he came up to gold and he was a writer. And then he got thrown in the hole. And when he got out of the hole, uh, he was desperately trying to get back into writing. And I was like trying to help him. Like, you know, like if I could, if he could produce good work, then I could say, this guy's working for me. And then it would kind of rescue him because I was always... I was always trying to like do things for some crew members like that. And it was just stupid because I definitely in the long run was not rewarded for that. Hmm. Although I have a, a lot of nice messages from people who love saying, because of you, I went and had a successful career. So <laughs> nice. That's, that's something. I wonder how many of those professionals um, working on films at gold know that they could walk out of there. And uh, depending on what strike is or is not happening at the time, walk into a pretty lucrative career in Hollywood. Like yeah, Rowan, I mean, you, did you know Rowan? You know Rowan at the base, right? You yeah, I know her really well. Her. She was like, I was kind of a surrogate father for her. Yeah, she's she works as a professional in the industry. I mean, yeah, she's, she's uh she's hugely a painter, successful. Which is, yeah, she she's doing really well. Yeah, they could all like like the Miscavige has convinced all these people that if they leave the Sea Org, they're going to be total failures yeah. in the real world. And particularly for the people at Golden Air Productions, nothing could be further from the truth. They're skilled yeah, well, workers. Yeah, I mean, I can't I can't really tell their stories because none of them have spoken out the ones that I'm referring to. But there are a few people that I knew in the early days who uh, were very became very successful. They're great stories. That's great. Uh, so, yeah, some of them figured it out. Uh, I had a guy call me up. He was a kid who I really liked a lot. It's a long story, but he he finally, he reached out to me after I left. He was practically in tears on the phone saying that, you know, because of me, he because I really looked after this kid and, and gave him a lot of confidence. And I thought he was really talented at what he did. It's easy to do that. And uh, he called me up and said, you know, I've been waiting 20 years to tell you this. But you gave me the, the 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 courage to leave and the confidence to have a career. And this guy was really successful. Did I kick myself yeah. out of my own stream again? You did, but I got to look at just Jeez. me alone for a second. It's this What's going on, Aaron? I, I use this mouse pad on my um my MacBook Pro to scroll through the comments, and sometimes my scrolling goes slightly the wrong direction. And oh yeah, I get it. I get and it. I go yeah. backwards. Oh Jesus, Lord! Well, okay, Almighty. I'm gonna. That's a drinking game. I get to take a drink. <laughs> All right, cheers. From my um, right, like a motherfucker mug. Okay. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I love it. That's um. Good. Okay, let me see. Let me get my little chat lined up here appropriately again. I so how far into the stream do you have to be before you can, you're, you're dinged for being profane? You never know for sure, oh, but okay. we're 32 minutes in, so we're, we're super deep. Oh, I know what I was trying to do. For all of the relative uh, newcomers to the stream, um, I wanted to, I wanted to um, tell them to go subscribe to your YouTube channel again. So I'll get that set up after we, uh, as we're answering the okay, next great. question. Great. Um, and I did see one specifically that I wanted to pull up. Okay, Steve Britton says, um, in another video, Mitch, you mentioned that David Miscavige got rid of Shelly and picked up a new <laughs> girlfriend. Did I understand that correctly? Does that mean he's possibly gone out to D? What are your thoughts here, Mitch? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay. So, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not the only one who said that, but his current assistant who's been with him since Shelley was around, Laurie Strickenbrock, um, may have had, I think, more to do with Shelley's disappearance. Because I, I, I think, and I wasn't really around them, but people who were closer to them said that the trigger event was Shelley becoming suspicious of their relationship. Um, and, you know, I can tell you that um, I knew her, her late husband, her deceased husband, Uwe Stickenbrock. He replaced uh, Jackson Moorhead as the security chief at Gold. And he was not a threatening person. He was a, you know, handsome German guy with a dark hair and a thick accent. And I had him in a couple of films. He did small parts in a couple of tech films. And he was tragically diagnosed with multiple sclerosis hung on for 11 years. Uh, when he got ill, when he was diagnosed, Miscavige ordered them to get divorced. So he didn't only banish his wife to a mountain compound, 
he banished his wife and and um, ordered his assistant to divorce her husband, and they've been together ever since. I mean, hmm. I I didn't see he and Shelley together all the time because you know she did her own thing and they were together a lot. But I've never seen uh, Dave and Lou. I've never the times I've seen them separate. Just I have like I a, have heard some people recently mention that. Larice, and I'm going to call her Larice because people are going to think fine. we're talking about a man if we call her Lou. Sure. Um, I've heard some people say that Larice and Dave were actually together much more often than Shelly and Dave. They are. I mean, in terms of their presence working wise, mm -hmm. like I would never see uh, Dave without Larice ever. I. I never did. They were always together. Every meeting, you know, she'd follow them around. She'd do the microphone. You know, she's just like, she. she's a genuinely, a, 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 her post is something like, it's CCR, which is COB for communication and something or other. But, uh, yeah. You know, a, um, one other thing I wanted to say that might actually serve to support what you're saying. It didn't actually occur to me until the last few weeks, I was putting some timelines together while I was getting ready to prepare for a video. Uh-huh, uh-huh. By the time of Tom Cruise's wedding, when Leah Remini said, where's Shelly? Because she saw Larice essentially sort of pat Miscavige on the butt. Yeah, right. Shelly had already been, if we want to use the word missing, if we want to say reassigned, reposted, removed from her post, she'd already been removed from her post for almost 18 months. By the time she was noted as being missing at Tom Cruise's wedding. Right. And the fact that she'd already been gone for 18 months and Leah observed what she thought that was inappropriate uh, behavior between Larice and Dave. I don't know. Could be. Could be what you could be what you thought it was. Yeah, exactly. I lost my uh, I lost my screen here. And the... oh, you, your screen is off, but. Uh... Well, just so you know, we yeah, can still see you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. I know I'm still live, but I've got, I think I've got to go back in. I've lost the screen that you're on. If you have to back yeah. out and come back in, that's totally okay. Yeah. Here we are. I oh, should be back. In. Well, now you're in here twice. Are you kidding? You um, okay. Oh yeah. You probably, um, you, you lost your browser. Um, yeah, you're in okay. here twice. I, I'm good now. I'm good. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. okay, good. So uh, since I've got everyone's attention right here. Oh, no, that was wrong. Oh, it's a total shit show over here today, you guys. Uh, let me share the screen of Mitch Brisker's YouTube channel. Um, bada bing. Mitch Brisker, Scientology, the big lie. Go over, show Mitch Brisker some, uh, some YouTube love. We played the trailer earlier we're not going to replay it again right now but he uploaded yeah, you can trailer. go to the chat you can go to the channel and watch it it's just i did it just to you know whatever i was just bored and uh i wanted to do something reminiscent of the dianetics campaign so so the big lie that is going to be the name of your book yes yeah it is yeah okay. how i made an evil cult look good fantastic in fantastic steps. um okay so we have um a super chat here from sp tv tattoo warrior uh, do you think it occurs to our elf that the level of people <laughs> who are leaving Scientology is getting closer and closer to DEFCON 5, wondering mm. how close we are to Shelley leaving? P.S. Everyone got their plane ticket for August 4th. I think that is uh, the date of Danny Masterson's sentencing in Los Angeles. Oh, right. <laughs> right. That's um, funny. What are your thoughts on this question here? Uh, on the exodus well, yeah. I, I think, okay, so you have the big, Scientology is a really interesting phenomenon. It's really like nothing else. You have what I call the big three, which is Scientology, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, big, visible organizations, and, and what do you have? LDS, 15 million followers, and you have Jehovah's Witnesses, I think they're eight or nine million. And then you have Scientology, which has like 30,000, 25,000, something like that. And, but you hear more about Scientology than you hear about these other ones. They have so much property and more than enough money that they can go on for a long, long time. I mean, it, it's just a matter of, of a reckoning happening for the people that are running it. That's what needs to happen.
So, but I, I don't know what they mean by DEFCON 5. You mean like the ultimate destruction of, I don't know what. Actually, um, yeah, DEFCON 5 is, um, do, do the DEFCON levels go up or down as they get more serious? Uh, DEFCON 3, I think that's the most serious, I thought. No, they go, there's, up. They go one to five. Oh, do they? Okay. Yeah. So it just means, um, you know, utter destruction, essentially. Yeah. You know? yeah. Oh, I got it. I got it. So yeah. that's when the nukes are, are airborne, right? Basically. They're, they're incoming. Like, you have five seconds. Do you think he realizes that things are getting more dire for Scientology, or is he convinced no, uh, himself no. that he's, he's in a good spot? No, no. The SPs are out of control. Okay, look, there's a mindset, and I'm sure you're aware of it when you were a staff member. There's this mindset that if there's a bunch of SPs outside your, your org and they're holding up signs, you know, that say, Mike Render Blue, so can you. That means that you are being effective at shaking up the environment and mm. you better double down. Do you remember this kind of mindset? Sign, that, it's well, the, the HCO policy letter is signs of success. There you go. That's when, it. When the SPs are howling, it means you're winning. Yeah, there you go. So that's, that's, I don't that's know what, how else to say it. That's what he's, that's what he thinks yeah, is going on. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah, and I mean, I'm the, sure he just looks at the bank account balance and he goes, we're going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be exactly. We're going to be okay. Yeah. All right. Lewis, um, Lou Ray, can you talk more about Aaron Mason? What was his situation there? What was your relationship? Did he ever leave? Thank you for all the info. Well, he was still there when I, I'm, I think he was still there. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't see people that you don't work with. You don't see them every day. Like when you asked me about Ron Miscavige, um, we can talk about that again sometime if you want, but because, you know, what was the story when he left? I'm like, I never, I didn't see the guy on a regular basis. So it's kind of the further distance you are away from per, a person. If let's say it was the cameraman, my cameraman decided to hop the fence. Somebody would come to me like the CEO or somebody highly placed and they'd sit you down and they'd say, look, so-and-so left, you know, this is what, you know, so-and-so will take over for him and we'll, blah, 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 blah. you know, it would be that kind of thing. Because what, I've got to walk on the set the next day and there's going to be no cameraman. But if it's somebody that you're at a further distance you are from them, the less you're going to hear. So you're only going to hear about people that you're really in proximity with. From, from my perspective, so Aaron, I wasn't working with him, but I know he was in the hole. I know he came, he was working for IMPR, International Management Public Relations, as a writer. Uh, he, he came up from OSA where he was... Uh, one of the editors of Freedom Magazine. And then he came up to me one day, you know, it's just like, you know, a, a number 10 tan because the guy had been made to work outside all day in the desert heat. And he said, listen, I'm studying, you know, he had study time now that he was out of the hole. I'm doing a lot of study and training and film writing. And I, I'm really hoping I can come work with you. And I'm like, well, okay, let me, I'll help you wherever I can. That was the last time I talked to him. And that was probably in 2018. 2018. And, but he was still on the base. Like, oh, he was still there. Yeah, no, this was at gold. This was like the, the story I told you about when Miss hmm. Gavage brutalized those three people. This was within 10 feet of that spot. It wow. was almost in the exact same spot. A very common area on outside of editing, on the way to the dining room hmm. uh, where everybody would pass through. But I really liked her. And I think he a, was a really well spoken, really well spoken. Uh, uh, like a, looked like an intelligent person uh, and he's a really good guy. Cool. He was one of those guys that like probably had a degree from a decent university and you, you would just think, oh, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> yes. No, I All mean, right. you would because you're having a bad time. Yeah. Okay. Joni Cummings says, I was referring to a bridge troll. I don't think I'm related to anybody in Hollywood. <laughs> Uh, with the last name huh. Cummings or Cummins. Jo Joni, there's a guy in Scientology named Tom Cummins, and he owns one of these companies that sells like deregulated um, utility service, or I don't even know how those businesses work, to be honest. And the guy's donated well in excess of $35 million to Scientology. I call him Scientology's Tony Robbins because he's got that same condition, some sort of form of gigantism. Like he's just a huge guy. He's, his head is huge. His, yeah. He's huge. His hands are huge. Um, and I, I, he's like Scientology's Tony Robbins, um, except with more money. Uh, do you think yeah. he's got more, more money than Tony Robbins? He probably does. Well, you know, we speaking of his job, his business, 
the deregulated, you know, he, basically he makes money because in Florida they decided to deregulate um, the, the power business and then basically turn it into an open market. And we tried that in California, but a company called Enron <laughs> kind of screwed it up. So hmm. California returned to regulation. And if they ever do that in Florida, that guy's he's a he's broke overnight. So that's yeah. a real tenuous business because it's just I, we saw what happened in California yeah. with Enron. So it's not a good idea to turn commodities into markets like that. I'll have to take your word for it. I wouldn't know. I grew up in a cult. But um, so Rich Share, thank you very much. And and Rue says, hi, Mitch. Do you have any juicy B-roll of Nano Miscavige somewhere <laughs> in a banker's box in your storage? No, I don't. I, I, I <clears throat> you know, when you don't know you're going to leave, you know, it's not like I was I, I had time and I was running around going, oh, I let me gather some stuff up. But I don't have a, sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> okay. Apostate Alex, welcome to the chat. Apostate Alex. Hi, Mitch. Welcome to SPTV. Can you tell us about any projects you worked on that maybe haven't been released or launched yet? Uh, no. My book. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. You mean for the church? Uh, no. Everything I've done is, is released and will probably be redone. I don't know. My name is not on the tech films. Uh, and even and they're all going to be remade anyway. It's like they were going to always be remade. I never had any expectations that I was creating some kind of a legacy of work that would last forever. I was just trying to get that place to the point where it could make films itself so I could leave. And, um, you know, I managed to pull both of those off. But the latter was kind of uncomfortable. But they do have somebody up there who I trained for seven years who's uh, very talented and is directing. So I did one film. I think it's the best film I ever did. I did it for the network. Do you remember the uh, the essay, Hubbard's essay, My Only Defense for Having Lived? Did you remember oh, yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the closest that he ever came to defend, you know, de defending as opposed to attacking. Uh, it's a really interesting thing to read. I mean, you can imagine just from the title, My Only I I was asked to adapt it into a film, and I think it's the best thing I did in the entire time I worked for the church. It never got released because I think Miscavige looked at it and he was like, no, I don't want... L. Ron Hubbard on, on Scientology TV saying my only defense for anything, let alone having love, because that's not good positioning. So, Wow. You, that think was, Mis you think Miscavige censored L. Ron Hubbard? Well, no, because he didn't, not in the sense, the, the essay is out there. It's Bridge publishes it. I'm sure it's in, in, a, in a book of text. You could read it. It might even be online. I don't know. But in the film, he, the films needed anything that goes on the network he approves and mm -hmm. he had never approved that for airing I see. yet from my viewpoint it's the best thing i ever did and I, and I think that it showed hubbard in the most positive light of anything that was done but you know i mean i don't i don't think that that needs to happen so i'm not disappointed that they didn't release it for that reason but i wish i had a copy of it because hmm. it had a lot of beautiful beautiful cinematic uh art in it it was just like interesting um okay so i like this one apostate alex asks when i worked at the london org i was told that all of the scientology super bowl ads and promo videos were written <laughs> but not made by Hold lrh on. you muted yourself i know i did because i i was my mic would have exploded from oh. hearing that um, <laughs> yeah I, I didn't know whether to scream or throw up in my mouth when i heard that you can always do um, both. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so let, let, for the, for those who are listening and not watching, I'll just when um I was told that all the Scientology Super Bowl ads were written by LRH, right down to camera angles and music style. <laughs> no, no. Oh, no, the, the obsession mean, to give LRH credit for literally yeah, everything I mean, I ever. Wrote, uh, uh, someday we could go through them all. I know. I mean, I know who wrote them all. Um, I wrote some of them. I didn't write the first one, but then I did the next, I don't know, three or four. And then somebody else who took over for me did them after that. But no, he had nothing to do with any of that. I'm trying to, I mean, he wrote, he wrote the tech films. He wrote the public films. That was it. I, I don't know if the public films like orientation is, would be considered, he wrote two series of films, one were the training films. And then he wrote the, what are called the PSMPS films, which stands for public Scientology motion picture series. 
and he wrote 50 treatments of films that are intended to enlighten the public about Scientology. So, but that's what he wrote. He didn't write anything else. He didn't, he wrote no commercials, no nothing. So, hmm. cool. Um, I mean, he wrote, he wrote enough. He didn't have to write those two. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is a throwback from the last um, okay. Q&A that Serge and I were doing, but I just wanted to address it real quick. Uh, Aaron, you said you would love to see a non anonymous protest at the businesses of Scientology Wales. Does it have to be anonymous? Could we form a grassroots organization and do the same? Oh, I only mentioned anonymous because they are simply the, the ones who organized all those protests. No, it doesn't have to be anonymous. It could literally be be anything. Now, I, I have to say, I, I, have, I have said on my channel, and I guess I should probably explain why I say this. Um, I don't encourage people to protest because I tend to feel it's a waste of time. I tend to feel it's not the way to change hearts and minds. But I've always said that in the context of protests that were done outside of orgs, because I know that me and my fellow staff members didn't really give a damn about those protests. All but right. I got to tell you, if I was a partner in a law firm with Vicky Podbereski and there was 100 people protesting outside of our offices every day and, and clients, you couldn't even bring clients to the offices because the protests were happening. That would be a big deal. Yeah. That would be yeah. a big deal if yeah. people were protesting outside of well i was going to say paramount but tom cruise doesn't have a deal with paramount anymore does he um he had that for i don't for, think so uh, I don't, who knows where um uh, uh okay forget tom cruise uh monique yingling whatever law firm she's a partner at if people protested outside of yeah. those offices that would be a huge problem for scientology yeah i still even saying that though i still go I still wouldn't like try to rally the troops and make it happen because I would feel bad asking people to spend their time that way. It's just that if there's people out there who really want to do that, that is, I think, the best place to direct the efforts. But I wouldn't I wouldn't lead some efforts to organize such a thing because I would feel bad asking people to spend their time that way. Does that make right. I, I mean, I've, do you feel I've explained that decently? Do you feel, Mitch, so. that I've explained yeah, that decently? No, okay. I think so. I mean, I think if people want to spend their time and they want to commit to that, it's 100% legal. They have a right to do it. I think if they know how to target it and focus it and they know what they're they're protesting about, they're like, if they're protesting Vicky Paparezki because she's enabling whatever, if the signs are right, you know, the messaging is right, you know, Anonymous had really good messaging, uh, per, you know, uh, courtesy of the Church of Scientology. Um, that I think it can be effective and some people do have the time to do it. But, yeah. you know, I mean, Anonymous, the initial uh, protest was over 7,000 people in over 100 countries. It, it, it needs to be something like that. You know, if three people show up, then they look like crackpots. No, it's got to be like 50 people, 100 people. Yeah, it's got to be big. Like they got to get yeah. a permit and like be blocking traffic. Yeah, I'm you not know. a fan of blocking traffic, man. Well, I mean, yeah, I know. yeah. But... I, I know what you're saying. When I see those videos, it makes me so mad. Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Free, free Zenu Project says maybe we should hire Enron to take down Scientology. <laughs> yes. Well, except they're yeah. Uh, I know. I know. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Denver Stevo says, Mitch, we need to get your channel monetized. I'm tired of paying Aaron for sitting back and letting an awesome guest do all the work. <laughs> Yeah, that's why we've got to get Serge's channel monetized as well, you guys. Yeah, I think Aaron's learned this lesson. Can you just let up on him, please? So. <laughs> um, thank you, Denver, Steve-O. But, but yeah, thanks. No. Thank you. But let me, you know, I always said, okay, you know the prohibition on, on fragrances in the orgs. Yeah, yeah. Right? This is a little, yeah. this is random. I'll make it quick. This is prohibition on fragrances. There's a reference that Hubbard wrote about that it, it messes with your, your, your head that it like re-stimulates you and it does all kinds of crazy things. And I used to la jokingly say, you know, gold is in an agricultural area. And I had once, I had once rented a, a crop duster that just sprayed water for a, for a Pura video to show how, you know, the, all the, the, to the, the pesticides in your food, I needed like a really nice shot of a crop duster. And I, it's, they're really cheap. And I'm like, you know what, if you wanted to take this place out, you just fill that crop duster with cheap perfume and you just fly <laughs> for gold. And it's, they you would, know, 
the reason I cracked up when you mentioned the agricultural area is that I, I try to compare Hubbard, you know, freaking out over people using um, good smelling fragrances. And you compare that to the, the int base that's next to, uh, you know, a cow farm that just yeah. smells like just pure shit. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, it's unbelievable. Thank God we're not using perfume though. Cause that's what yeah. would really screw people up. Well, it would be a bad mix. Yeah. I mean, that area is also kind of governmentally corrupt. Riverside, San Bernardino, there's a lot of, it's probably, those dairy farms, I, I just want to, in defense of dairy farmers, those dairy farmers are breaking a lot of rules and regulations. They're getting away with a lot because dairy farms don't have to smell that way. Um, yeah. But anyway, the ones there are, because they're in such a, a, a corrupt area, they're just horrible. They're just, uh, their gold was always fighting. There's one guy adjacent to them who was a dairy farm and the guy was, you know, he apparently was an alcoholic. He was arrested for drunk driving and he never took care of his, his cows and his property. And boy, when the wind was going the right direction that, you know, your eyes were just water, you couldn't even breathe. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And um, then where, whenever you have that, you have flies and wherever you have flies, you have spiders and it was just like a party. So, uh, yeah, Sounds it miserable. Bad. Sounds yeah, miserable. it was. Go ahead. Apostate Alex says, I would love to hear your thoughts on the gold tour video still on Scientology's YouTube channel featuring you. Will they edit you oh, out? Yeah. Will yeah, they edit you out? I, yeah, that one I got to go, uh, which is one of the reasons I'm doing it. this. I don't want to be in that thing. Well, I, I here's what you should do. Here's what you should do. Um, this last sentence says, would love to see a reaction video with your commentary on who else is featured, et cetera. You, one of the best ways to get them to remove you from that video is for you to do a reaction video to their video on your channel. <laughs> okay. I can do that. Yeah, I could. I certainly know all those people, but it's like. You should wait until your channel is monetized so that you can be like, see, Dave, yeah, yeah, if you yeah. keep this video up, I'm going to keep making money off of you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you're right. I should do that. And I'd like to get the, uh, I could do the same thing on the Ron, Ron Miscavige 2020 videos. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, those videos, they weren't done for a website. They were done as a res to give a response to 2020. Mm. And 2020 didn't use any of the footage mm. except for, I think, 10 seconds of Monique Yingling. So they had all this footage. So then they made a website out of it. But we oh, 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 oh. You're talking about the video that they have of you talking smack about Ron Miscavige. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You should totally do a reaction video to your own yeah. video that you yeah, did. Yeah, I could do a little, I could do a little window of me. Oh, man. Maybe I'll wear a Guy Fox mask and then take it off. Do oh, a big my reveal. God. That yeah. is, that would be so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would be, that would be funny because I'd like to get those off of there. I hate those. And I didn't know that they were going to be put on a website. Yeah. You oh, know, that's that, a, was, that didn't occur to me that you thought it was just to go to 2020. You didn't know it was going on a website. Well, I don't think anybody thought it was back. Then. I, I don't think that was ever a plan until the whole thing. What do we do next? And then I'm sure it was Miscavige's idea. Put all that stuff on a website. I mean, we went through considerable trouble to shoot all that stuff. I mean, we shot for three days. I shot Norman Starkey doing a walk and talk up at the LRH house, you know, that $40 million house that they built for him, Bonnie View. Yeah. There is a, a library like in that house that is so spectacular. Like the entire Western canon is in that library, plus everything L. Ron Hubbard ever wrote. Really? Um, and it's all made out of teak and it has vaulted wooden ceiling. I mean, it's just like unbelievable. And so I did this walk and talk with Norman you know, I, I squeezed a crane in there and did big sweeping shots and, and Norman talking about L. Ron Hubbard and, you know, uh, crazy stuff. And, and it was all done so they could show it to ABC 2020, thinking that they were going to go, oh, well, man, maybe, you know, these are the good guys and Ron Miscavige is the bad guy. So they used none of it except wow. 20 seconds of Monique. Incredible. Maybe even 10. And then so... We, we had all the footage, so what are they going to do with it? They put it on a website, and then I was like, oh, fuck. I only realized this, like, maybe a month ago that it was ever on the Internet. Because I, wow. I don't search my name because... Like, you just made me wonder about something. What? What? 
Well, like all the videos that, for example, are on the hate website that Scientology created about me. Is yeah. there a chance those Sea Org members who sat down to do those videos didn't know these videos were going on the internet? Oh, no, they do. Oh, okay, okay. No, because those were made for... Absolutely, because they had no other reason to do it. We were making a response. You know, 2020 had a had a, an exclusive deal with Ron Miscavige to, to talk about, interview him and talk about the book two weeks before it was released. Mm. Okay, like... That's where it broke. And so they contacted the church and said, well, like they always do, uh, do you care to respond? We're going to do this show. Do you care to respond? Okay. So we all went up to go. I was working at ASI with, on the Narconon program with Ms. Gavage and another guy. And so we all drove up to go and uh, all of us, me and another guy, and everybody else was already up there. Uh, and we shot all these videos. The response was a bunch of videos. You can use these. Here's our response. And a big basket of the most beautiful, scrumptious baked goods cooked, you know, baked by their Italian chef. I kid you not. Like, okay, so, so 2020 says, we're going to do this segment with Ron Miscavige. Do you have a response? And the response was baked goods. Like, I'm not even kidding. Okay. I mean, yeah, there were all of our videos and stuff, but this guy, Panuccio, the baker up there, I mean, I, I uh, you other people, he's very talented. He did Tom and, and Katie's uh, cake for his uh, the wedding in Italy. I mean, this guy was actually born in, in the next village from where Tom got married to Katie. I mean, you'd think you're going all the way to Italy. I mean, they flew a cake from gold to to Italy. I mean, they built a special... Whoops, they built a special like box to transport this cake. I have no idea what they spent because it would have had to be refrigerated. Uh, but yeah, the cake at his wedding was made at gold, right? By this baker. And this guy's really talented. So they baked up the little loaves of like poppy seed and, you know, gingerbread and all kinds of cookies. And they wrapped up just like a, the most luxurious five star bakery you could find in Beverly Hills. And put them all in a basket and they sent it up. And I remember Miss Gavage was like, you know, when these guys find out that this is what we provide for our crew, they have this baker. How could they think that we mistreat our crew? That is so pathetic. <laughs> no, I know. And, and it was while we were shooting, these bakers were coming out of the kitchen, you know, like, and we were just getting the samples like left, right, and center. So it was like, oh, this one. What do you think of this one? Yeah, it's pretty good. This <laughs> this will throw them off their game. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, I I heard on good. I, I I don't know if I saw the picture or I heard about it somewhere that, you know how like when DEA agents like make a big bust and they all pose with a stack of bricks of cocaine, mm -hmm. like the ABC 2020 producers they laid those speakers <laughs> out on a table, and they stood back and like posed with them like. Do Look you know, what we got so, from this. It's so funny that you mentioned that because when Mike Rinder was doing his book tour, his book press, yeah, yeah, and Monique Yingling showed up to do the um, uh, it's a, a you know, it was some morning show on ABC or NBC. Yeah, or she something. brought baked goods. She brought baked goods. I remember. <laughs> no, this is a thing that they do. They're like, that's why. That's like, why Mike calls her Muffin Monique Muffins oh, Yingling. Right. Yeah, <laughs> she yeah, brought exactly. muffins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's the thing they do. I mean, this guy is a really talented. I mean, he he's a very talented baker. He makes They're, birthday cakes for the whole crew. Like that, he's, you know, he's helping to clear planet Earth one cake at a time. Yeah, one yeah one muffin at a time exactly. One muffin so. at a time pastry. Um, okay, let's do one little uh, softball here, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, Steve okay. Britton, how long has Mitch been out of Scientology? Well, it, it depends how, what you mean by out of Scientology. What, is, what, of, it, what do you mean by out of Scientology? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Th yeah. Well, I think the day that I saw him mistreating those three people, I kind of sort of psychically moving away from it. Like it was like a wedge that got pounded between me and it. And um, but it took me years and years because, you know, I was older. I didn't have contacts. I, I couldn't the next day go get a job. It would have been eventually I just had to jump out of the airplane with, you know, with, with an armful of silk and a sewing kit and hope that I could, you know, fashion a parachute before I hit the ground, which is kind of where I'm at right now. Right. So. Um, 
but f- sort of physically, legally, uh, when 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 um, lockdown hit, uh, it was a very good mechanical reason. I was given a choice, like if you want to keep working with us, you have to come and live with us until this whole thing's over. That's how paranoid they were about it. Oh my God, these people were bleaching the bottom of their shoes. It was insane, uh, and uh, yeah, there was like like everything that came in and out of gold went through like the equivalent of an airlock. There were guys in hazmat suits that met every truck, every box, everything was D7 down. They went completely apeshit over all that stuff. Like it was unbelievable the degree to which they locked down. And I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. So I kept doing a little bit of writing jobs and things, but I sort of just bailed out and then said, look, I don't have time to work for you guys anymore. Then I went through, you know, a, a really severe period of not good stuff mentally, physically. Uh, and uh, then I was like, fuck it. I just, I need to, you know, you, you, you need, when you, when you uh, interact to the degree that I did, I mean, I was a, a real enabler. I mean, I made so much money for that organization. Uh, I didn't do bad things to people like dirty tricks kind of things, but when I think about the stuff that I, you know, I did the LRH Live exhibition. I did tons of ads. I did all the Dianetics ads in the 80s I, that was responsible for selling 10 million books. Although Jeff Jeff Hawkins gets the real credit for that. Uh, when you've sort of been that involved and then you don't want to do it anymore, I guess if I had some lucrative career to walk into, I'd probably be too busy to do in this. But I, I just felt I really need to do it. Does that make sense? Is that... I Is that so. kind of a so yeah? I started leaving 15 years ago. I stopped interacting with them a few years ago. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to sort of piggyback on what you're saying here, when sure. people ask me that question, I respond the same way. It depends on what you mean by leave. Like, yeah, there you in go. In 2009, when I read the Truth Rundown series of articles in the Tampa Bay Times, that for me was the beginning of my route out. I didn't officially get declared a suppressive person until 2014. So that's when they said, you're no longer a Scientologist. Right. But I was, I, that was five, uh, wait, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. That was five years in the making, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, I'm still going through it. I mean, I still, I still fall into this weird kind of stuff, but I mean, I got an email the other day asking me if I wanted to join the Sea Org. So, <laughs> like, gotta love it. Yeah, they gotta be pretty desperate. They're picking on old dudes like me. All right, guys, uh, jump over to Mitch Brisker's channel on YouTube and subscribe. Once, uh, uh, I mean, just imagine all the stories that Mitch can put up when he can do it all on his own. Uh, doesn't doesn't have to coordinate schedules with anybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, um, I, I like going on with you, Aaron. I think you really do a great job. Well, thank you. I mean, we, we, there's so much we can talk about, and I and I hope we do it uh, many, many more times over the next. Yeah, week. I have a whole Maybe. bunch of stuff that I, I wanted to talk about if if things slow down, and I'll, I'll I'll send you something if we can work out how to talk about it. Awesome. Well, everyone, we're gonna call it a we're gonna call it a night. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thanks to everyone who watches. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Good night. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click right.